right? Mm -hmm. Oh mm -hmm. boy, what a foolish kid I was at the time. <laughs> and that was, <laughs> but that started the journey. That started the journey. I start. I, I then uh, figured out well, if I want to do this, how am I going to make this transition? I found a school in San Francisco called Pyramind, and I just started interning there. So here I was, you know, mm -hmm. an executive at Silicon and HP at the time, and I'm going then to be an intern after work at Pyramind you know, moving furniture around, checking lists at the door, whatever it was, I just said, I want to figure this thing out. So I got in there. Uh, through that, I met a gentleman named Clint Bajakian, who, uh, who was at the time the head of music production for Sony Games. Mm -hmm. And he took me under his wing and we sat and we talked and he said, okay, over several months, we started talking and became friends and he helped me sort of plot a, a trajectory or a path to make this transition. And part of that was going to USC. So mm -hmm. I ended up, you know, getting into USC, the film scoring program, and then the rest was sort of history from there. But to get back to, that was sort of like the, the preamble. And I'm sorry, we had to get through all of that to give you, to set, up, <laughs> set, up, set up your question. That was a very no long worries. question. It's a two-part episode. Very long answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be the trilogy. So, um, <laughs> so when I got out of USC, it's not like there was Warner Brothers waiting for me saying, hey, we have your mm -hmm. first feature film ready for you. Here it is, right? Mm -hmm. And, you, you know, go. having, yeah, here you go. And then after, uh, also being a second career, you know, I, I, while I was in software, I had acquired a wife and two kids. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they weren't into this whole sort of starving musician thing. And, <laughs> oh, we can go back and live with my mom. This is what I saw. I was like, no, we ain't doing that. So, <laughs> with all that in mind, I figure out how to make money. Mm -hmm. And that's where another friend of mine, um, this guy named Peter Rotter, who's a contractor here in LA, musician contractor. He said to me, well, you know, you've got this technology background and now you have this newfound education in music. Why don't you combine the two and hang a shingle and do technical support technical development for other composers mm -hmm. i was like whoa that's a great idea and i had been doing that sort of piecemeal for this composer and for that composer mm -hmm. uh and it, but i never really thought about sort of formalizing it into a business mm -hmm. so he gave me that idea and composer tech was born and mm -hmm. i found a composer tech with another classmate from usc and we, you know, ran that company for about seven years mm -hmm. with, and by the time we, you know, eventually shut it down because we just got so busy with our uh, composing lives, we had about 150 clients around the world. Mm. And some of those clients, I had a chance to work with them intimately while they were on projects. Mm -hmm. So for example, I worked with Alan Silvestri, you know, while he was on uh, Night at the Museum. And I got a chance to do some technical programming with him for that project. I worked with Alexander Despla um, on several projects that he was working on at the time. And I was able to, you know, get a chance to uh, get a credit, you know, working with him uh, because I was setting up his systems and running basically uh, his technology for him. Mm -hmm. So that's how I was able to get some of the early credits in my career on some of these big movies through the technical side of things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this sort of leads me to, you know, a piece of advice I just want to give to, you know, anybody who's listening to this who's starting figuring out. That piece of advice really solidified something for me, which was when you are trying to break into something, you've got to figure out what skills do I have right now that can support me and that can help me be valuable to other people that are doing the thing that I'd like to do eventually. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was technology, you know, being able to say I knew technology and I had a few skills from, you know, running software development teams and being a product manager that I was able to then transition into this and develop a company and uh, persona around that. And, you know, for other people, it could be their orchestration skills. It could be, mm -hmm. you know, their musician skills, musicianship. It could be the technology. But what is it that you can offer to someone? that can, you know, first and foremost, put food on the table for you because obviously, you know, pursuing this career, especially in the beginning, you're not gonna be making a lot of money writing music for projects. Mm -hmm. um, and secondarily, how do you get sort of access to at least being around the people 
that you want to emulate. And almost like through osmosis, you will start to be able, you start to pull in just little things that eventually will help you as you move forward. Now, you have to be very careful because, you know, a lot of these folks, they're busy, they're working, and they're, you're there to do a specific job for them. They might not have hired you to do additional music, so don't ask for that, you know? Mm-hmm. Don't expect that because mm-hmm. that you're not there to sort of ruin that relationship. But you can figure out what are the things that I can ask at a certain point in time, right, that will be helpful to me. So, for example... Um, I did work for Teddy Shapiro and Alan Silvestri. Never wrote a note for them, which was totally fine. But when it came time for me to, you know, find an agent, I asked Teddy Shapiro, I said, hey, would you mind uh, asking someone at GSA to have a meeting with me? And he said, I would love to do that, but you should also ask Alan Silvestri, who's also your friend, and we can write a joint letter together, right, Mm -hmm. introducing Mm -hmm. you to a junior agent at GSA at the time, Kevin Korn. Uh, which was super lovely, you know, that they did that. And they took, you know, an hour out of the day to write a letter for me or an email and send it off, right? So that was something that I could, and that helped me immensely because now I had a relationship with an agent. He eventually, Mm -hmm. uh, after several stages, signed me. And, you know, that really helped my get my career off the ground and a couple of uh, studio films uh, that were really the beginning of my career. So it's really about being, you know, strategic and trying Mm -hmm. to find people I think do want to help you, but you have to figure out, well, how can I, what is the ask where they can help me, but at the same time, they can do it quickly, efficiently, and I'm not taking advantage of the relationship, you know? Mm -hmm. Sorry, so that was a very long story, and I apologize, but hopefully it all (laughs) makes sense. (laughs) No, that's great. Oh, yeah. It's it's always fascinating to see the different ways that uh, musicians weave their careers, you know, and, and it, a lot of it seems to be uh, being open to the idea of doing something completely different from what you originally thought you were going to do. Right. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, I have to ask, particularly because I can see a little bit of your setup behind you, but <laughs> as a... Uh, as someone with like experience and insight into software development, uh, as someone who has insight into like software dev, do you prefer using like a notation software or do you use like a right. DAW or a combo or something completely not related to either? You well, you know, own? it's funny. <laughs> yeah, did you make your own? I did not build my own DAW. I did not build I'm tired my own of DAW. logic, like, just made one. I'm just yeah. make one. Exactly. Um, yeah, well, I hope that never happens. <laughs> um, okay, so on the technology side, one of the things that was frustrated me when I was an undergrad mm-hmm. is that we didn't have this immediacy of being able to hear your ideas being realized in any sort of real way, right? Or any sort of mm-hmm. realistic way. You know, again, I went to school in the, the 90s, so the late 90s. And, you know, these tools were just starting to sort of come to fruition where we could actually have uh, realistic sounding um, instruments. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I started out with working in, you know, uh, notation software, finale and all that stuff. And it was also super frustrating because mm-hmm you really couldn't start to, you know, experiment in a way that made sense to my brain and hear things sure. in a way and be inspired that made sense to my brain. Well, finale so, definitely is still frustrating. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Fair enough, fair enough. I'll give you that much. Um, so for me, you know, when things came alive when I started working in a dog. And again, mm-hmm. it started with the garage band and then eventually it graduated to Logic and then mm-hmm. at USC, I moved from Logic to Cubase, and okay, I've been yeah. with Cubase ever since. Ooh. And you know, a lot of my process, at least the music that I make now, uh, it's a combination of not only traditional cinematic or orchestral-based music, but mm-hmm. also a lot of popular music that's being brought in, such as you know your sure. R&B or your gospel or your hip hop, which mm-hmm. obviously relies so much on you know music production out of a computer, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, having a doll like Cubase that allows me to blend all of that together in sort of one interface and one uh, program has really helped me realize the kind of music that I want to write and that I'm being asked to write. So I spend, you know, 
all day basically in Cubase. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, you know, in the beginning of my career, I did all of the orchestration and uh, mm -hmm. parts and scores myself. So I would transfer that into Sibelius and then, you know, do all of that work there. And I also did orchestration for other people. Uh, mm -hmm. One of my first gigs is I actually did orchestration on the Iron Man 2 video game back in like, ooh, <laughs> like 2000, uh, when was that? That was like uh, 2011 or whatever. Yeah, That's I was so. in the sixth grade. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness. Oh wow, okay. This I played over. that. I'm done. Yeah, this, this, yeah, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, so I, you know, I did some orchestration stuff, uh, for various people, city of USC, uh, which was great. And then having those skills to do that, but really, you know, now I have a team that I work with, uh, I have mm -hmm. an orchestrator, another guy I went to USC with, uh, Jeff Tinsley, you know, he handles all of that now at this point and he's, you know, wonderful. And I mentioned Peter Rotter, who's a contractor. So at a certain point you start to build, you know, a team of people around you that support you. Uh, mm -hmm. And obviously the technology and the tools is really what allows you to do that, um, right. especially in a place where you got to be so remote from each other, uh, mm -hmm. which is especially in today's case in point. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Cool. That's super awesome. Yeah. And then, oh, you know, as far on. as I the think Gracie was trying to ask a question, but I think oh. maybe turn up your mic, Gracie. I could see you talking, but I couldn't hear anything. How's that? Oh, wait, a, oh, there we oh go. that's a lot better. Oh, okay, oh, wonderful. Oh, yeah, I'm so there. sorry about I that. I promise I just, we're not that's... ignoring you. We just can't hear you. <laughs> no, that's I fine. Didn't even I didn't know I... she was there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, who's Gracie? <laughs> Um, I, I just got a new focus right yesterday, oh. actually. So this is its like maiden voyage right here. So I'm, I'm happy that we're working now. Okay. Wonderful. Right. Um, so when it comes to sonic branding and bringing in different elements of different kinds of genres of music and facets like that and creating something new, how do you determine which elements are important and which ones are not? Does it depend on the context of the song or the character you're developing? Or I just would love to hear your thoughts on that. Interesting. Hmm. I think we live in a wonderful time for film scoring because there's this desire now for all parts of the movie making process to be authentic mm -hmm. and to really push the story ahead in an authentic way. Mm -hmm. And that's finally sort of caught up with the music. So one of the things that I think about as a composer is what would make the music feel authentic to what we're seeing on screen, to the characters, mm -hmm. to the story. And how can the music feel like the people that we are currently watching? Mm -hmm. One of the ways I like to do that is by integrating and creating sounds that come from the production itself. So one of my first, my first feature that I worked on, The Land, uh, with the director Stephen Capel Jr. Uh, the Land is about uh, four skateboard kids who, let's just say, don't make great decisions and end up in a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. As kids often do. As kids often do, <laughs> right? As kids often do. And unfortunately, these kids didn't have, you know, parental safe, great parental safety net to sort of keep them in. But anyway, um, I decided to integrate skateboard sounds into that. So I hired mm. a friend of mine, uh, Bill Stanke, out of uh, Pittsburgh. And he went to a skate park and he recorded all these sounds of these kids, you know, on skateboards doing their tricks. And then we integrated that and turned that into rhythmic elements, uh, turned that into drum machines that we were then able to integrate and be part of the score. And it became the percussive uh, rhythmic element of the score. And it felt obviously super organic because it was pulled from that world. I did the same thing on United Skates, which uh, is a, you know, a film about documentary about black roller skating culture. And we, I said, hey, send me all that production sound that you had from all the skate stomps and the skate screeches and the rolling wheels. And I was then able to, again, build percussive beds out of that and integrate that into the score. Now, you know, a lot of times nobody will know that that's actually happened between, like, besides myself and the director, that you know, those sounds came from there. But still, it adds, I think, even on a subconscious layer, a level of authenticity and connectiveness to the story, right? Because you're doing something unique from the story and integrating that into the music. Yeah. Um, the other thing that's also important too, 
for me is I don't like writing a whole bunch of, you know, synthetic sample based orchestral music. Um, I know we can do it. I know people can do it and it sounds amazing. And sometimes um, uh, folks can't tell what's live versus what's, you know, coming out of the computer. Mm -hmm. But for me, I, I, I try and figure out, well, based on the budget that we have and based on the story and the size of the story, what is an interesting ensemble or sonic elements that we can bring that doesn't rely solely on the computer, mm -hmm. right? So I just finished working on this film, it's an indie feature called The Last Night in Razi. And, you know, it's a small story, it's three characters, probably like four locations, so very intimate and, you know, small story. So the score, and they didn't have a lot of money. I mean, it was a micro budget film, so there wasn't a lot of money for music, but I still wanted something that was going to be, you know, organic and authentic. So I came up with this palette of uh, humming, body percussion, and upright acoustic bass mm. with a little bit of synth pads in the background. Mm -hmm. And that was it. Now, it was cool because I can hum, body percussion i slapped myself right i mean I, <laughs> that was free too right <laughs> so there was that and then i have a great you know friend um who uh carl vincent wonderful bass player here and, and actually i met when i was at usc and we worked together on mm -hmm. a lot of stuff together uh he came in and we spent a day just sort of you know writing bass stuff and mm -hmm. he uh record you know we recorded him live so you know without just by trying to be inventive and coming up with, uh, I, I thought an interesting palette, we could create sort of an evocative score that doesn't cost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And that's where um, I try and push myself, is not to always rely on the computer, because we can do great stuff out of the computer, but mm -hmm. what can I sort of bring in that's interesting? And using really the budget as a great way to curtail or rein in what's possible and then work within that constraint. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Sorry, did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That answered my question. I, um, I find a lot, I, I'm more on the technical 